Okay. Thank a lot to the organization so to invite me to make it possible online. So it's a hard time for this pandemic. Uh, so it will be an awesome experience. It's my first time online. Uh, let's do it happens, right? And I want to share right now is uh, all the my experiences since I become like a data engineer and all the mistakes and the success that I achieve uh, after doing a lot of mistakes, of course. Um, let's present myself. Uh, I'm a developer with more than 16 years of uh, experience. I'm originally from Brazil. Actually, I'm living in Berlin, German. Uh, uh, I've been learning Python science. Uh, I started to learn in programming. Uh, Python followed all my career, so of course it transitioned for different technologies along this time, but mainly using Python as much as I can for several reasons, but uh, Python community is a passion as well. Uh, I'm deeply involved with software communities, especially in Brazil, and I help it to organize several company, uh, conferences. Uh, I know how, how much work you need to do for organize a conference, so uh, thank you again the organization for, for making it happen. Uh, I would like to hear from you uh, feedbacks about my talk in my Telegram. That's BSAO0, uh, or my Twitter, BSAO. And I'm currently working at Microsoft as a data engineer for a product named Microsoft To Do. That's a task list. It's a pretty awesome uh, product. So try to enjoy the product. Uh, this is a small agenda that you talk today. It's not about the code. It's not about programming. It's about how Python fits in the data engineer roles and some learning the lessons about the data products, right? Uh, we will talk about uh, anat anatomy of our data products. It's just to equalize our knowledge about the, this aspect of the software computer program. Uh, you talk about two kinds of architecture, two kinds of uh, model architecture. It's one lambda and one kappa. Uh, you briefly talk about the quality of a data pipeline that basically is the quality of a software uh, computer. <coughs> Uh, computer software, and then where the Python, Python matters, that's most important for us, uh, when you can use Python and it's each aspect of a data product. Uh, my goal for this presentation is to uh, start uh, helping you to plan, plan a great data-driven product, right? Let's talk about the anatomy of a data product. This is very interesting because in the big data world, so you have one thing uh, that's named the five weeks that uh, describe the aspects of the big data, right? And each V of these, uh, these aspects, as, uh, it's, it fits in one part of one data product. Everything started to happen in, uh, in grass part, or how you call it, when you collect all the data that you need for a, a product. Today, it can be like a telemetry, logs, database, interaction, events, whatever you can collect from an interaction of one software with the other, or one user with one software, can be considered a data, right? And this in this collection, this ingress uh, happens in a, in a layer or in a part named the ingress, of course. And there's two Vs that fits these parts, the volume or amount of data that you collect from these, these uh, another parts and vari variate of this data. It can be like hot text, it can be images, audios, interaction, whatever you want. And which kind of data you hold in this part? So is a structured data, is a one structured data. So you need to define it, right? And all this kind of data is stored in one thing named data lake. Data lake basically is a big place where you put everything related with the data. 
binary data, hot text data, uh, images that I told. So everything is centrated on the ingress or data lake, right? Together, you have uh, another part that's the process. The process when the magic happens, when you get this raw data and transform this data in, in data that can be start to be consumed. Or it means uh, when you start to bring the value of your data, right? You are talk, uh, let me put here, we're talking about this part, okay? Uh, when you need to process this data or you get all this uh, variate of this data and start to process. And you, when you try to bring the truthfulness of this data, for example, so you can ask for yourself or ask for your team. So our manager, our team can rely on the data that you are processing. So you started to process in this part. So, and this is the code. This is the data sets. Data sets basically is part of this data that you start to process, okay? And together with the veracity, you have the velocity. How many time do you need to process this data? How fast is you can process this data? This matters, right? Imagine a bank that you needed to process the payment, credit the cards that you needed to prevent the frauds, social networks, ad platforms that you needed to, 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 to bring for you in milliseconds or to decide in milliseconds which kind of advertisement they needed to, to show to you, right? This happens in this layer named the process, right? And the egress when you serve this data, right? So you put this process data in databases or you serve this data in APIs that it can be consumed for different softwares or you can plot in a dashboard. This is very important. This veracity uh, is uh, uh, a thing that's common related with value. Value is very important. So it's how you see the insights of your data how you can discover the, 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 the things, the issues based in the data that you process. How can you rely in your, your data? It is very important. Based on these premises, you have the anatomy of the data product. This is different for the architecture. This is the anatomy, like a body. So you have your arms, you have your legs, so you know how your body should work which part of your body uh, should uh, uh, work, but exactly how we implement it, it's not exactly uh, sometimes how it works. It's important to have this differentiator. If you look at this, this plot, basically it's the same. So this is a, a computer programming, right? So you have the input. Input is like you're clicking your button in a software or you interact with your app or a command line application doing some uh, batch process for you. So you have these inputs and inside your, your computer, you have like functions, variables. So, so it's interacting in memory RAM and you have the process in the end, you have the output. The output can be in a window, a table or another API that can be consumed. If you see a data product, basically is a computer computer programming, nothing different like that. Talking about the how you implement this anatomy, so today you have like mainstream architectures that well used for the market. One is a lambda architecture and another is the capped architecture, right? I will describe briefly these architectures in order to you have to equalize this knowledge, okay? The first one is Lambda. Lambda comes uh, 10 years ago, more or less, uh, as to bring to us, uh, um, how can I say, to bring it to, to the market uh, a layer above of the just a simple map reduce uh, model, right? And they bring the idea to deal with a huge amount of data in an efficient way. And here you have two premises. One is to reduce the latency between the, the, the process, right? So you can get a huge amount of data and process it in a, in a, in a tight, in a, in a small uh, window time frame and try to be near real time. This is the first premises. 
And the second premise is that we call it event source or any change in the data state should start a new event in the system that can be reprocessed. Or it means every time that you, need, uh, you receive a new data, every time you receive a new event, you need to reprocess this, uh, this, this data. The concept of the event sourcing basically is make predictions and start the changes in a real time basis, right? In a, in a, in a historical time. So you receive an event right now, in a few seconds after you receive the new event, you need to store this event in a, in a, in a historical way. That you can you can build a sequence of events. For example, again, a bank transaction. You try to pass your credit card in a, in a, in a supermarket, for example, and you are denied to for that. And after, because uh, it's because you faced some fraud detection, and then you try to to pass it again, and for some reason it comes successful. You need to understand this behavior along the time because, for example, your machine learning model is failing for some reason. Right, so they are identified. Sometimes it's a fraud, sometimes not. And this kind of uh, uh, change in the data or the change of the behavior uh, generates a new event, right? Then change the state of the data because first time you you got a, a, a denied denied the transaction, and after you got a successful transaction. It's very important to understand uh, this concept of the Lambda architecture. This happens inside the batch layer. Batch layer basically consumes the data from the system simultaneously with the speed layer that I explained after, right? And any data that comes from the, the data lake or for the ingress part that you are talking about, uh, generate a new state of the data, and then you, you need to reprocess it every time, right? How you receive this data is up to you to, you to decide uh, the time frame, okay? The second part is running together with the batch layer. You are talking about the speed layer. Speed layer is the result of the batch layer. It means every, every new state of the data, the speed layer get these results and started to proceed and to deliver this data as a new delta. No delta new means a new uh, uh, a new state of this part of the data in a certain time of the in a certain time, right? For example, you got a, a piece of data right now. You have processed your batch layer. Your data got a new state, and now your speed layer are able to train your machine learning model or to generate a sub data set or a data set of your data and delivery to be carried, right? This is why the speed layer works. They try to work as in a near real time basis to serve the users to reduce the latency and the queries uh, uh, to answer uh, the business answer quickly, okay? Uh, just it's important that, uh, to mention that batch layer, it's one thing is not about the real time, okay? But speed layer is real, uh, is near real time, okay? In the last, in the last part, you have the server layer, and the server layer means that where the user or the system come to to get served about the data that you process. Here you have two ways. One way is the batch layer that permits you to query your source of truth, it means the data lake and all the batch views that you have, for example, for each state of the data that you have in a certain time, you can go there and carry that date or the speed layer that you can consume your data near uh, real time views with the rich data. It means at time, uh, which time that the batch layer uh, produce a new delta, a new, new, new. Uh, each each time that a delta a batch layer produce 
a new version of your data, a new state of your data, they enrich the data in a speed layer. For example, uh, let's get a, like a social network, for example, that's based in advertisement, like, uh, uh, and then you are interrupt with a content based in, in stock markets, for example, and then uh, the real, you start to collect in these events because you are interrupted with stock markets. And for some reason, you change uh, drastically your interaction for cats, for example. And then, uh, and then speed layer are able to enrich this data or the link between these two interaction, you as a user, to serve to uh, another user to, anal to do analytics, for example. What's the relation of a user <laughs> that has using uh, stock marketing and then change draft list to see funny cats videos, for example. This is a stupid uh, uh, example, but just to you understand how the interaction between the layer works because you need to enrich the data. And then speed layer, you serve the sev serving layer in order to you enrich uh, the data and get this data in a real time uh, basis for you, okay? Uh, let's talk about the application of the uh, application of the the lambda architecture. The first thing is, if your system, if your uh, platform, data product that you are developing, when you are talking about the, the, the data product here, it's not just the pipelines that's part of the data product, but imagine that you have like a system, like a social network or a bank transaction that you need to uh, store your data uh, permanently, for example. This is one thing that you need to take in account in order to design your architecture. So uh, Lambda architecture fits it, right? When you need to carry your data, and your data should be immutable. This is another application of the, the, the Lambda architecture. When you, the, the system and users need to, to, to deal with a huge amount of data, and you update this data and serve as a new data set. This is how the, the Lambda architecture works. For example, you have a huge amount of data about the behavior of your users. And then you need to extract a subset of these, these behaviors in order to create another data set to serve for different products. It's how the, the Lambda architecture works for you. And of course, you have like pros and cons for these uh these architectures the pros is basically is because it's re a, a reliable and safe why because all your data is stored in a, in a distributed file system right so if any catastrophe happens or if you need to reprocess all the data you can you can do it from scratch right so you can go to your data lake and reprocess all the data and then you take uh, probably will take a long time, but you can do it. So it's safe for you to keep all this data. It's scalable because you can scalable horizontally or vertically. But it depends who, which software you are using, which technique you are using. So it permits you to have this flexibility. It's, especially if you, for example, you are a small company that you are using a cloud-based solution, or you are a huge company that decided to deploy your stack in a, a, a on-premise uh, way, for example. <coughs> Sorry. And if you needed to manage all this data, so since you are deal with a distributed file system, probably like Hadoop or S3 or another uh, storage from Azure, for example, uh, you are able to, to deal with this fault tolerance uh, issue most part of the time. But you have the cons about this architecture. One of the biggest cons is you have a way to do a premature data modeling because basically you need to understand how your data started to be stored in your data lake from start in order to avoid a lot of changes because changes is hard to get managed in, in the Lambda architecture. For example, 
If you decided to change the schema of your own data set, probably you needed to change the code that generated these, these intermediate uh, data sets and probably it will bring more problem, more complex to your code. And then sometimes you start to prematurely data modeling your, your, your data and this become a mess. You need to take care about that, right? It might be expensive because your data is growing, growing, growing. And if you need to process it in each cycle of the batch process, it's becoming more expensive because you need more machine, you need more compute process, and then you need more storage and it's become more uh, expensive. So you need to plan step by step how your data architecture is growing. And then you talk after about the capital architecture because you can basically split uh, your architecture in two architectures, right? And as I told, the code can become complex because the separation of the concern of between the layer of the process can be a mess. And then you need to have like a well tested. You need to invest more time in test in tests your data pipeline with different approaches, regression tests, unit tests, end to end tests. So uh, this kind of approach can be expensive for you as well. Now let's talk about the Cap architecture. Cap architecture is not a replacement for the Lambda architecture, but an alternative to provide uh, a performance for some scenarios, as I, uh, as I explained before. Sometimes you don't need to store all this data, but just the process data to serve, right? So this is, this is useful for you. And basically, Cap architecture fits basically stream softwares right so like a uh, uh, software that you need to perform a real real neo time process for analyticals for user behavior let's see a uh, 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 a b test for example you don't need exactly to store all the interaction of the users but you need to check a small uh, change in your interface for example how this are being affecting the performance of your product. The cap architecture, cap architecture help you to reach this, this scenario. For example, for example, Apache Kafka, that's a, a mainstream or a de facto tool for streaming nowadays. You can, for example, uh, store all your events there, analyze this event in a real time, and just search or just query the result of this analytical in a single stack for you. And it solved the problem to extract the insights and values for your data. But you don't need it to store this interaction, for example. You can consider a CAP architecture as like a simplified version of a speed layer. But the CAP here is more about uh, uh, serving real time views for one specific problem than then storage or deal with stored data. So you need to uh, manage this uh, slightly difference when you decide which approach you want to implement in your application, right? Um, one of the, my mistakes here, so unless you are desperate for real-time answers, just keep in the batch process. If you are not a bank, if you are not a, a huge company that will need like a real time process because it's very expensive for you to develop it, to maintain, to, to deploy, uh, stay in the batch process because near real time process, probably you, you, you solve your problem. It's, I commit this a lot of times trying to, 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 to bring you real time uh, insights for my, my, my clients, my stakeholders, but they learn it that two, three hours is enough for these guys to understand the, the, the biggest. But from the market perspective, you're talking about technology perspective, right? Applications, here, as I told. So if you need a well-defined event order, you don't need a well-defined event order, or if you need to interact with a certain time, uh, uh, data set or any time your data set, cap up the uh, uh, architecture is for you, right? Uh, system that requires a real time learning, 
as I told you, social networks that needed to learn with you, how you are interaction, fraud detection, add platforms. So cap applications is for that, right? Machine learning models that needed to be uh, uh, reprocessed every time to understand the user behavior doing another user behaviors, right? And the most important things, if your application just uh, the the challenge of your application is how you maintain your code, cap applications for you, because even you need to deal with a huge amount of data coming to be processed in your application. What matters is code. If your code change, you just need to deploy the deploy your code again and don't need to reprocess it. You just change the behavior of your code. If you change the behavior of code, you change the behavior of your insights. Like, it's what's matter for the cap application. <coughs> okay. If you need to leverage your machine learning uh, for a real time basis, it's a process for, for cap architecture, right? It's a good thing about the cap architecture that they, 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 they they let you use to run this horizontally scalable. For example, for the Kafka, probably you don't need to put more nodes, but you need to increase the size of your store, the, the temporary storage in your machine, so you can just horizontally scalable this this machine. You don't need to put more nodes because the process and the storage will be different for that. So you reduce the the amount of money that you are uh, expending in, in this time. And if you need to repro uh, reprocess your data, you just need to reprocess this data if your code changes, right? Not if your data changes. If your code changes, you can reprocess it if you want. Different from the approach of the batch layer. Like uh, a machine, uh, machine learning model, for example, that changed something, you just need to deploy this machine learning model and just keep this data coming and the, the, res the final result will be different, right? You don't need to reprocess it, okay? The cons of this, 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 this approach. If you introduce a new bug, if you introduce a new error, you, you need to have a better exception manager uh, for your code. For example, so if you introduce a bug and you need to mitigate this bug fast enough, probably you, you pipeline and you will be stopped for a few minutes or you start to deliver wrong data for a few minutes. Imagine a bank, for example, that uh, deployed a new fraud detection, machine learning, whatever, right? And then you found a bug on that. Imagine how many million uh, of uh, dollars or cash these this guy, uh, these guys are losing along this time because a small bug uh, uh, permitting some transaction that could, could not be uh, allowed, for example. So uh, this brings to us uh, the same cons from Lambda Architecture, this is the complex of the code of how tests your code should be uh, submitted, right? Now let's talk about the quality of a pipeline. Independent of the, the architecture that you decide or the architecture that fits your in your solution, imagine it as I told you, it's a computer program. The problems basically are almost the same. If they're almost the same, basically uh, the industry, the community addressed all the solutions for that with tools, techniques, uh, uh, people, documentation. So uh, the difference that uh, uh, computer programming and a pipeline, for example, basically is the kind of input that you have, right? And uh, there's a, a, a quote here that I, I learned in some lectures sometimes is, if you see that something you get wrong in a software, probably you get wrong in a data pipeline as well, right? Uh, the most important thing for a data pipeline here as a data product, right, is the security because you need to take in account uh, the access level between the data. Who can access your data lake? Who can access your processes data subsets? Who can access the results of your process? It's very important that you keep your, your level of access uh, uh, in, a, in a professional way. 
especially if you are dealing with sensitive data like transactions, user behaviors, user data. Who can access this data? Imagine that you have a lot of leaks along the time in the industry. Which kind of procedures you need to, to implement in your architecture to avoid these leaks, right? You need to work together with different teams, operation teams, security teams, how you are introducing your code, right? One of these, these techniques is using a common, uh, common format to store your data if you can. For example, parquet files, other files, JSON files, how you can interact with this common format that you can implement this access uh, layer to this uh, common format. Separation of concerns in your code, for example, is a security concern as well. Which part of your code can access which part of your data? How this code can process this data? This is permitted or not? And another thing is, Avoid hard coding and duplication. It's a mistake as well. Try to dynamize it. If you put hard coding things in your data, like uh, formulas, paths, or, or yes, formula paths, uh, duplication of code, probably you are introducing security issues in your code that can leverage for a leaks or a way that you can uh, permit uh, unauthorized people access your, your data, right? Uh, versioning about the automation. So the addresses is a common thing in the market. So you use your code, so you version your code, you have your branch, feature branch, you, you, you version your code in a Git and another version system. Uh, about the automation, uh, use the power of different tech platforms. Don't try to use just the, a, simple, a simple platform for that. Try to mix the, the tools. Sometimes it helps you, like uh, continuous integrations, a continuous uh, deployment for that, which kind of tools you use. And of course, the code review linked. If everybody knows how to, to link a code, for example, let's imagine that you use uh, like JSON schemas for, uh, for defining schemas of your, of your data sets. It's an example. So you can link this, 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 this part of code, this part of text or code review in pair programming. Uh, try to automate all the part of the data pipeline. Don't touch your production environment as well, right? Don't run tests on the, your production environment because you have access layer. So use all the things that you can to automate your stuff is in a data pipeline as you do in a software engineer, right? Monitoring. Let the cloud help in you to monitor the things. If you are not a big company, uh, delegates the log metrics, the monitoring, the infrastructure monitoring to the cloud for you. It's 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 basically a must nowadays. If you needed to check the logs of your application, that's not the part of the logs that you needed to process. Delegate it to 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 some cloud-based tool, so you have a variate a variety of this this tool. Avoid vendor locking. Even if you are a big company, try to avoid vendor locking. Ninety percent of the tools nowadays is as open source, so you are able to deploy these tools on your uh, on your infrastructure. You have a vast amount of documentation. You have the, a, a huge amount of people in the communities of the big data and data that can help you to develop. So. There is no reason to you have like a vendor looking for some distributions, right? Even if you are talking about the cloud, avoid this kind of vendor looking. For example, Azure has like AD inside, Amazon has EMER. They are like a, a, the full uh, distribution of some uh, these big data tools that you can easily uh, remove your code, or remove your pipeline from these tools and implement in another tools. It, this is very important, right? You have to, this kind of requirements in your architecture. This is most important, how you implement the tests of your pipeline in traceable your pipeline. As I told to you, uh, try to implement uh, in a cloud-based logs, infrastructure monitoring, but if you are deal with a complex pipeline, implement regression tests to see how your data are changed along with the time. And then you can identify bugs on that. 
especially for models, machine learning models, how you are adapting your, your code. Try to have like impulses, inputs that are determinate, determinate, deterministic, like any unit tests in, in, in software. You have input, you have output, you need to test how it uh, works inside this function, right? Try to focus on the unit tests for your pipeline. Try to uh, fragment your code in a, in a way that you can test uh, small parts of your input puts in outputs like if you have just one function that interrupts one piece of part of a user behavior test well tests well that part and then implement in your code in the second part tests all the third party components of your pipeline for example let's suppose that you have uh, a kafka a hadoop and a zookeeper a pandas uh, all this integrated in a tool. Test this third-party tools if this part is available, uh, a disaster recovery for these this, uh, third-party tools. Everything should be tested. And in the end, so is the most cost, is most expensive for small teams or small companies, implement end-to-end -end tests for this whole pipeline. It's very important. If you introduce a new component, if you introduce a new uh, feature for that, uh, you need to test all the components, third-party tools, all the regression tests, and you need to see the results in the end as you, you, you need. But you need to keep in mind, I need to be trust, so it can be a mistake or it can be a successful uh, decision. Test a data pipeline is really cost. It's really cost. You need to know the certain time to implement the tests or which kind of tests you need to implement your data in your data pipeline. If you try to implement all the tests from scratch, probably you lose a lot of money. But if you don't test in the in the in the beginning, probably you lose a lot of money as well. You need to, to find the average uh, on this. Okay. Now let's talk about where the Python matters here. Here are you exposed most part of the tools that I work at in the Python world uh, for integrate uh, the tools that I mentioned before, Hadoop, uh, Kafka, Storm, Spark, whatever. But now you just talk about Python, right? I will describe briefly which kind of tools that I, I work at and then, uh, and then uh, you can decide more or less. I will give some advices on that. As I told you, I don't show any code, but I will just give you some advice. The first important thing is that UTL. UTL is basically struct, load, and transform. It's where the magic happens in the, in the data world. When you get the raw data, when you transform the data, and you will deliver the value. The most important here is the PySpark. PySpark basically is the facto uh, tools for uh, batch process nowadays. PySpark basically is a Python API for Apache Spark. That is a software that was built uh, in, in, uh, above the JVM, runs in, in, in servers, nodes, right? They have like executors and they have like a master. And then you have like a Python API that you can interact with that, okay? In another hand, you have like a Python tool. is a Python wrote in Python named Dask. It's a parallel computer library as Apache Spark, but it's more focused on the analytical computing. Why? Because they integrate uh, in a nutshell pandas and NumPy. Basically, you have just a unique Python stack that you can uh, run in parallel uh, most part of your functions uh, using Python. You don't need a different uh, stack as you need uh, Python Spark. Uh, another tool is Luigi. Luigi is a model in Python that you can build complex pipelines for the batch process. This is important, right? This is a, a open source project that was created inside Spotify, right? And they have different supports for different kind of data sources like databases, uh, Hadoop, uh, text files. But basically, you can implement a pipeline in a Pythonic way. 
you can describe your classes, your classes can interact with your other classes, and then you, ha you have like complex pipeline that you can manage. It's a very interesting tool. I really recommend you to start your pipelines using Luigi if you can, right? MER job is a old tool that I started to use a long time ago. Basically, you can write your MapReduce jobs in Hadoop, basically the concept of MapReduce uh, in Hadoop and run, and uh, they translate the Python code into uh, Hadoop code or Java code, and then you can run uh, uh, MapReduce job in Hadoop, right? I never, never use the uh, Ray, but they are a parallel distributed uh, Python-like desk, but they are focused on machine learning ecosystem. Uh, I cannot recommend or not, because can recommend or not, because I never use. Uh, reading the, the documentation seems to be a very interesting uh, product. For the stream, if you decide for some reason to, to use the approach of the Kappa architecture, so you can use it fast for using a streaming process, uh, basically for the Kappa process, uh, Kappa stream for, for Python, so you can interact using uh, getting the, the messages or the messages from the Kafka and using as a Python object inside your code or stream parsing. Stream parsing that uses uh, the same concept for Apache Storm. I use the buff. Uh, I like it to use it fast, so it's a very Pythonic way to deal with the, the Kafka streams. I will recommend it for that, and you can interact with your Luigi code, for example, if you need. Because Luigi code, uh, you can implement your logic inside in, in certain methods, so you can use this to implement your... Even Luigi is, bu is built for batch process, you can use uh, some some aspects of stream processing in Luigi as well. For analysis, so basically you are talking about the pandas. Pandas is de facto tool for uh, for analysis in Python. Probably everybody uses this one, right? Blazing uh, is an interface that you can consume big data in different ways and interact with pandas, right? You have open mind for BI. I use it once, uh, not in deep, so I don't have like a recommendation for that. But I never use the origin on either uh, Optimus. It's, I just introduce it here as option for you. Okay, this is very important. So, if you need to run a pipeline, even you have uh, a good pipeline, a solid pipeline, you need to manage and you need to schedule it like a clone job. But Python has Airflow. Airflow was built by Airbnb a long time ago. Now it's an open source project of Apache Foundation. And there is a complete platform for you programmatically uh, schedule and monitor all your workflows. You can, you can integrate with Luigi if you want, or you can create your own batches and streaming process using Airflow. Airflow. Airflow can replace Luigi if you want, or you can work together with Luigi if you decide. Nowadays, uh, in my personal experience, at least in the last two years at Microsoft, I'm using Airflow to manage and schedule all my pipelines. It's easy to deploy, it's easy to uh, dockerize, for example, it's easy to ship my monitoring and my scheduling, uh, my monitoring and scheduling, my management as well. So if I needed to change any part of my, my, my code, if I needed to change any part of my pipeline, I can just redeploy it and run a back view. I can, I can reprocess everything using just the flow with a few clicks. I don't need to execute anything by the command line or whatever. It's a real, uh, really good tool for that, right? For the tests. So, of course, you have a PyTest for test your code, but it's very important that you need to simulate uh, tests, uh, data tests. So, like create fake um, amount of tests, or you need to create uh, Spark data frames. Uh, I didn't tell uh, before, but uh, Spark uses like a different uh, data structure inside it, though. So, you need to mock these, these data frames 
is different from data frames from brand, but you need to 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 mock this data frame from from most part of the time. So you have this framework that is in the GitHub Spark testing base, so that you can mock the behavior of Spark to your test your code. It's essential for uh, PySpark code. Uh, fake to DB. If you need to test the the database generated to test your code, right? And um, and for the valid, uh, validation. Validation is very important because when you define your data scheme that is being ingressed for your data lake, for example, or the data scheme that you are serving for a certain amount of APIs, you can use some Python tools for that. Serverless is one of that. I guess you have like a talk about that uh, today. And you have a schema that you can uh, validate your Python data structures or volume tools. That's another Python tools. So you can integration, you can integrate with your pipeline, and then uh, you can you can fix, as I told you before, about the premature data modeling. So this kind of tools can help you to uh, facilitate this kind of modeling um, and fix some schemas that you need to start to ingress your data. So this is good, right? Um, I finished my, my talk, hope to bring some insights for you, hope to bring some experience that I have. Sorry if my accent or my English is a little bit bad, so uh, I will try to improve, of course, it's part of my 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 accent, uh, it's possible for, for you. Now you open a channel for questions, if you have any questions, uh, please. Uh, reach me by email if you want, hello at bison.me, or please ping me on Telegram or Twitter. Uh, I really appreciate your feedback for any part of this talk to improve for the next talks, okay? All right, thank you for your talk. I think you're, I cannot really say anything about uh, your English. I think it's perfectly fine, but your spasibo Thanks. was just perfect. And uh, <laughs> I, I would assume it's much, much harder for me like to say obrigado with a similar level of accent. So um, I would say that we need to wait a little bit between the translation and Zoom. So just around a minute until it's synchronized and then we get to the questions. Uh, ребят, да, если вы хотите задавать вопросы, я напоминаю, что вам надо перейти в Zoom, где мы это делаем, и вам надо тогда... При, когда вы задаете вопрос, отключайте трансляцию, не забывайте поднимать руку, и если у вас есть проблемы с формировкой вопроса, то, конечно, спрашивайте по-русски, мы поможем, если что, перевести. Вот. Uh, uh, while we're waiting for a question, I have uh, one of my own. I was recently improving, like, stabilization of our data pipelines in a company, and uh, I ran into the fact that there's not that many uh, tools available for PySpark end-to-end uh, -end testing that are integ easily integratable to uh, CI infrastructure. Like, how you typically solve that? Do you have a local PySpark uh, cluster inside, for example, Docker container, and then you run the pipeline? Or is there any tools that, can, uh, that you can use to avoid that? Because I assume it's quite heavy to on the CI system. Um, У меня есть ощущение, что наш спикер отвалился, поэтому э, даже не знаю, да, мы можем не попробовать замерить. поговорить между собой, может у кого-то есть какой-нибудь интересный опыт или он хочет поделиться, как э, он или она, э, хочет поделиться тем, как они тестировали и там разрабатывали, набивали шишки на э, продукторизации дата пайплайнов. Я, например, знаю, что Луиджи, про который э, упоминалось, он э, уже считается деприкейтед и неподдерживаемым, и все вот активно переезжают на Airflow. Даже те же ребята из Spotify давно уже пытаются переводить на него пайплайны. Мы вот активно используем Airflow в нашей компании и тоже столкнулись с тем, что пришлось все докеризировать, и там гигантские докер-образы для Spark Job, они вынуждены скачиваться и иногда очень сильно нагружать сеть. Так. Я не Робсон, но привет. Да, привет. А, да? Борода просто шикарная. Специально отращивал, сидел в карантине. 
Так вот, собственно, тут ответ очень простой и очень сложный одновременно. Это долго и мучительно, потому что нет готового рецепта, как вот сделать сразу все хорошо. Тут, к сожалению, придется страдать, тем более технология относительно новая. И... О, кстати, кажется, мы видим Робсона. Так, ну мы пока можем продолжить э, поливать. Да. Похоже, он ушел. Похоже, Робс у нас не понял, ушел в дискуссионную зону. Поэтому мы можем здесь э, продолжить по пообсуждать. Мне интересно, да, закончить мысль про страдания. Я люблю страдать. Вот. Oh, we've been just discussing uh, that. Uh... Okay. I think you can можем... repeat your question in English, uh, so we can uh, join Robson to our discussion. Yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I guess that the discussion will continue in the d discussion room. Uh, oh, okay. Everybody left us. Okay. Perfect. Ah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's check uh, if anyone. Uh, have questions uh, in uh, Discord. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Nope. No questions. Okay. No worries. Yeah, I think uh, your talk uh, was uh, really understandable, and everybody. Oh, we should really implement it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have a question of my own. Uh, For sure. <laughs> we have uh, recently implemented uh, a streaming pipeline. And uh, now I've got a pretty tough question. Uh, how can I sleep at night? Because <laughs> it can break at any moment. <laughs> the, the question of the, the, the streaming pipeline is, is, I told so, is about the code because you have the cons that you need to at least know how your data scheme is coming because if the data come in different, probably your pipeline will break all the time or they will deliver you empty data. Uh, I suggest to you also to start to modeling your data from, <laughs> sorry, from the start, it's from, from the beginning and define a valid uh, scheme of validation for you on the, which message if you were using Kafka, Oh yes. So so you can use like a message JSON messages or Avro messages that you can define. Uh, I, I recommend you to use Avro Avro messages or Avro, Avro files for that. That you can define a well defined the schema for that, and you make sure that if your data that are coming is different from the schema, they you can send it to different quiz and just process the data that you can. This you avoid you to break your pipeline. Oh, okay. Uh, we have uh, a jury uh, who uh, joined us. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, uh. I Oh, uh, we have a colleague who joined uh, us uh, to listen. Um, okay, mm. so uh, another terrible question because uh, uh, a lot of people who are not in this uh, room will probably uh, asking uh, this one. Uh, we have a bunch of scripts uh, which do ETL uh, jobs like a lot of Python scripts, uh, SQL scripts, uh, a lot of uh, homegrown pipelines uh, which use uh, some bash scripts uh, and a lot of scripts running on Chrome and uh, people look uh, at it like crazy what's going on and uh, Nobody does anything to it uh, because it works. How to switch uh, to something uh, better like Airflow or 
Okay, uh, for this scenario that you have different kind of uh, scripts, the best scenario is to migrate or to start to implement their Airflow. Why Airflow? Because Airflow can handle any kind of process for that. For example, you have uh, Mesh scripts, you have like Python scripts, you have SQL scripts, and then uh, Airflow can handle which kind of this uh, uh, kind of a process like, and then you can link between uh, in a Pythonic way, how the process depends of uh, each other like in a graph or in a DAG. It means that you need to execute these Python scripts. If they return a, a exit zero or success, they come to the next and they can run a SQL a script on a database and then you can get this result and then you can implement or you can execute the next step. This is the, the advantage to use the Airflow and bring your legacy data pipeline into a more professional way. If you have time, it's another suggestion, if you have time and money to invest, I would suggest you to use the Luigi approach because the Luigi approach has the same concepts. You can execute bash scripts, you can execute SQL scripts over a Python driver, right? So the BIPI 2.0. And then you can execute, for example, Python scripts, uh, MapReduce scripts, or Spark scripts in a Pythonic way as well. Everything integrated in the same code base, right? That's an awesome uh, approach as well. But uh, using these legacy uh, requirements, I would suggest for the first try to implement the Airflow. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, and okay, uh, and uh, if we are going to batching or micro batching, uh, uh, I see uh, the results uh, from voting. Uh, Oh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, okay. Uh, where is it? Ah, uh, someone stole uh, the vote. Ah, uh, here it goes. Okay. Uh, when I asked people uh, what uh, do they use, uh, what do they use uh, for the data processing, uh, either batching, micro batching, or streaming? Uh, I just uh, for fun uh, added uh, the first uh, response uh, and for some reason it leads uh, the world right now. Uh, so how do you know when to use uh, batching or micro batching or switch to streaming? So it depends the nature of the data product that you want to use. Let's start about the streaming process. Streaming process means that you need basically real-time data being served for some proposal. Uh, again, uh, let's use the example of the uh, bank, a credit card company that you needed to decide in few seconds, in, in few milliseconds, if they should approve or not your payment in the in, in the supermarket, for example. This is the kind, and then, sorry, and based in this scenario, you have a machine learning model that is being trained all the time to make, to, 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 to let these, these algorithm to decide if you can approve or not this transaction. This is a typical scenario for a streaming process because you are receiving a bunch of data Right, not just the transaction. We receive a bunch of data, like amount you are receiving, the localization, uh, you are receiving the the profile of the user. So you have a different variables that you need to process in a real time and deliver a yes or no, for example. This is one scenario that you need to use a streaming process and a powerful tool like a Kafka, a Spark, or another machine learning uh, tool, for example, or a desk for, for that. But if you have like, for example, a user behavior analysis for IAB test, for example, it's a common scenario. You deployed a new button, a new button in your uh, website. You change it from blue to green. Okay, so, and you wanted to see if it's converting more products being selling for you, 
right? But you don't need it to know it in a real time. This is a, a batch process because you collect all this behavior and then you get this part of subset and you compare with the, your historical data. This is a batch process, right? But if you decide if it's a, a, a mini batch or a small batch or a big batch, depends the nature of the process. What you need to answer is, it's not the amount of data, but if you need to parallelize your, your data, for example, right? Uh, small data needed to be parallelized because what matter here is the latency, right? Uh, for example, if you have like a, a big data set in your notebook, you have like 20 gigabyte, gigabytes of uh, CSV file, right? But you have like a big, powerful uh, notebook with its supports to you open this, this file, and then you can process and do like a small uh, batch process just in your, uh, in your machine. You don't need to paralyze it if you, are, and if you do it once, twice per, per week, for example, or whatever. Like even you just use a simple machine in your cloud provider. But if you need that, if this patch requires to be executed every day. If this data you grow up, if you need it to be fast, of course you need it to paralyze it. This has become a batch process, a simple batch process that can be handled by Spark, for example, or for the desk, it depends if you need a analytical time. But in a general way, it's so easy to implement a batch process in Spark and execute a Spark job in a cheap way that doesn't make sense for you to differentiate mini batch process to a batch process. Just implement an easy way in a, in a Spark way and deploy it in like in a very small cluster that you have like the same uh, the same uh, result for you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, if uh, no one else uh, have questions, uh, I'd like to to thank you for very nice talk and uh, for uh, really good uh, insights uh, you provided. Uh, um, okay, I think uh, it's uh, bye bye. Thank you so much, everything. So thanks for the invitation again. I love to talk and hope to see you soon. Better soon. Yeah, stay safe. Stay bye-bye, stay safe as well. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, bye. Yep, thank you. Goodbye. Um, uh, please note that there is a link to Zoom after parties. So if you're interested, you can click it. It is in the chat part, so you can join. Okay, perfect. Party part. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.